So over the next few minutes, our goal really is to review a methodical approach to making the diagnosis of prosthetic joint infection in contemporary practice. And without a doubt, application of these principles and techniques um, uh, after you leave uh, the, you know, kind of the confines of this course, uh, these things will help you uh, and they will definitively help your patients. So making the diagnosis of periprosthetic joint infection is really kind of broken up easily into three phases. The first one is to assess the patient, and that's really involving a comprehensive history and physical examination, and we'll talk about some key components of what that means. The second phase is testing with routine serologies and x-rays or imaging studies, and finally having a very low threshold to move towards aspiration. This is what you need to do for all patients because all uh, symptomatic joints are infected until you prove otherwise. But this fourth arrow, I think, is extremely important. Some of these cases are not going to be solved that first time through the algorithm, and rather than uh, sort of uh, bailing out and uh, just sort of going right to the OR and hoping for the best, sometimes the best thing to do is to pause, reassess the patient a few weeks later, and oftentimes that will lead you to the correct diagnosis. So never be afraid uh, to, to re uh, rely on that fourth arrow. So the assessment. Even though the title of this is looking at trying to make the diagnosis in contemporary practice, most of what we are going to accomplish you can do with old school asking good questions and doing a good physical exam. I love this picture, and in the bottom right you can see sort of the Mayo monogram on the pillowcase. Uh, we no longer have those, but I would love to have one if we, can, uh, if we can track those down. But really, there's two things that you're trying to do in that assessment. You need to be sure that the infection evaluation you're doing in the office that day is going to be accurate, and we'll talk about how to do that. And really, you're trying to compile a bunch of factors that are going to raise or lower your index of suspicion for whether or not that patient in front of you has an infection. The accuracy is all about the antibiotic holiday, and I think it's important to ask patients multiple ways, have you been on antibiotics lately? No. Have you taken any antibiotics for anything? No. Have you been to the dentist lately? Yes. Did you take antibiotics? Yes. Okay. <laughs> now we're talking. That little bit, that extra question can really save you as you're trying to explore this. We know that multiple clinical practice guidelines have recommended a minimum of two weeks and clinical practice guidelines are great, but this is a recent study uh, published by my colleagues here looking at what happens if you don't do it. So they were looking specifically in this study at patients that were trying to establish an infection early on after hip or knee replacement, and they kind of subdivided patients that had had antibiotic exposure within two weeks of the arthrocentesis. And what they found is what you would expect. That, even small exposures, significantly depressed serum CRP, synovial white count and, and uh, neutrophil percentage, as well as the synovial absolute neutrophil count. So in short, that recent antibiotic exposure will dramatically increase the risk of a false negative PJI evaluation. And you're not gonna know that unless you ask. And sometimes you have to ask in about three ways. So here are some other things. Again, we talked about in that assessment, you wanna figure out have they taken antibiotics recently or not. It sounds simple enough, but it's not always. But here's some other factors that you should really try to gather that are gonna raise your suspicion and make you look harder for infection. So, of course, if they've had a prior diagnosis of infection, if they've got risk factors for infection, early reoperation is a big one. Patients that have had wound issues, sometimes you'll hear a history about they've taken, you know, they, they went home from the hospital and they were given, you know, three weeks of antibiotics afterwards. Sometimes that's prophylactic, sometimes not and then looking specifically for joint effusion or unexpected loosening. So an implant that looked great on the initial x-rays, it's a great design, good track record, and now it's showing up loose, have a really high suspicion for infection in that patient. So what about testing? Testing's really two things. It's serologic testing and it's imaging. The serologic testing, these are kind of the cutoffs that we all know about. <clears throat> you can see that in general, the CRP is better than the SED rate. It's important to keep in mind that routine serologic testing should always be done when you're evaluating patients for uh, symptomatic joints to look for infection. Again, you have to keep in mind if they've just had antibiotics, these numbers might not be valid and you might need to bring them back a few weeks later. Also keep in mind that somewhere around 4% of patients may have a true periprosthetic joint infection and have both tests be negative. So just because they're both negative does not automatically mean that there's no infection there. 
What about serum D-dimer? I think it's fair to say if you look at a lot of the studies out there on this as a potential either replacement for or addition to routine serologic testing, I think it's fair to say that some of the promising early results in follow-up have shown, I would say, inconsistent reproducibility, and further study is definitely warranted there. But at this point, it's not a routine part of, I think, our uh, workup of these patients. Plain radiographs, you're looking at mecha mechanical integrity, of course. You look for those early progressive radiolucent lines, so that knee x-ray on the left there, you can see those radiolucent lines under the tray. That's a total knee that's only been in for about 14 months. So that should really get your attention. Osteolysis or periosteal new bone formation, if you look at that hip x-ray on the right, you can see a little bit of both. That's a patient with a chronic infection. Advanced imaging is really mostly either white cell scintigraphy or FDG PET CT. In short, these tests have high sensitivity. So the power of a negative test is much more than the power of a positive test in terms of trying to make this diagnosis. At the end of the day, these are rarely needed expensive tests, and I usually use them if I'm looking for potential spine infection, if I can't get fluid out of the joint and I'm worried, or in patients that have multifocal infection. The image in the middle is a patient of mine. I think it's the only one of these tests I've ordered in the past year or two, but this was a guy that had all kinds of things going on, including an infected spacer and an infected total knee replacement. You can see it lighting up over there. The aspiration is critical. Any patient with clinical suspicion, you're gonna aspirate, regardless of what their labs show, which goes back to the initial assessment. Any elevation of sed rate or CRP, any patient that I'm planning to take to the OR for revision of a total knee replacement, I'm gonna to try to get some fluid. And then even those patients that everything looks perfect, if you're planning a massive reconstruction, it's probably worth your while to aspirate that patient ahead of time. What not to send? I think it's fair to say that gram stain, fungal and mycobacterial stains, and fungal and mycobacterial cultures routinely are not terribly helpful. Exceptions for those fungal or mycobacterial cultures, not the stains, but the cultures, would be patients with immunocompromised, prior history of atypical infection, or recurrent culture negative PJI. What should you send? Send the white count, send a differential, aerobic and anaerobic cultures, plus or minus alpha defensin. Alpha defensin is an antimicrobial peptide produced by neutrophils. You can see its performance in terms of sensitivity and specificity there. It is most powerful as a confirmatory test. So when it's positive, that's gonna get your attention a lot more, or should, than if it's negative. This is a recent study out of uh, our institution looking at the diagnostic accuracy of synovial alpha defensin, both the lateral flow and the ELISA test. And at the end of the day, we found it here to be comparable, not superior, to the combination of synovial white count and differential. So putting it together, what definition do you use for a PJI? There's, there's a little bit of debate about this. I like the 2013 definition, which is that you've got a PJI if you've got a sinus tract or two or more positive cultures of the same organism. If you don't have that, these are those so-called minor criteria. Again, elevated sed rate and CRP, elevated synovial white count, or uh, leukocyte esterase positive. And I put that little blue box there to call attention to the cutoffs that 10,000, 3,000 are imperfect, as are those uh, percentages. And so that, I think, is where alpha defense and helps me, is when I have that patient that's in that borderline region of a white count, they're in that borderline region of a percentage, with a positive alpha defense, and that might be important for us to recognize. And you can see the others there. So again, it's three phases. You're gonna assess the patient. You need to figure out if they've been on antibiotics, because that's gonna throw everything off. You need to know. You're going to test them with routine serology um, and imaging, and you're going to aspirate them and send them for the basic stuff, and that's going to get you home 99% of the time. And with that, I'll close.